on World News Tonight. A nuclear pact. The United Kingdom along with America and Australia introduced a renewed promise of security. Union address. Ursula von der Leyen kicks off a fresh start with brand new policy measures. Allied humanity. Pope Francis pleads the world to side with the vaccinated. Curtains up. Broadway arises from the longer slumber, roaring back bolder than before. From the global resources of the Verna Media Network, this is Other Verna World News Tonight. Now reporting from Studio 24 in Colombo, here's Suzanne Shainali. A very good evening and thank you for joining us on World News Tonight. We start off today's coverage from a brand new security pact in the Indo-Pacific. The United States, Britain and Australia said that they would establish a security partnership for the Indo-Pacific that will involve helping Canberra acquire nuclear-powered submarines. Australia is set to get U.S. nuclear submarine technology as part of a new security partnership that also includes Britain. On Wednesday, the three countries announced the initiative dubbed AUKUS. The leaders say it aims to preserve peace and stability in the Indo-Pacific. None of them mentioned China, but Beijing's influence over the region is growing. Today, we're taking another historic step to deepen and formalize cooperation among all three of our nations, <clears throat> because we all recognize the imperative of ensuring peace and stability in the Indo-Pacific over the long term. The first collaboration will be to develop nuclear-powered submarines for the Australian Navy. The leaders stress the submarines will be powered by nuclear reactors, not armed with nuclear weapons, and will allow the Australian Navy to operate more quietly for longer periods and provide deterrence across the Indo-Pacific. Australian Prime Minister Scott Morrison. The future of the Indo-Pacific will impact all our futures. To meet these challenges, to help deliver the security and stability our region needs, we must now take our partnership to a new level. But let me be clear, Australia is not seeking to acquire nuclear weapons or establish a civil nuclear capability. And we will continue to meet all our nuclear non-proliferation obligations. Britain's Prime Minister Boris Johnson called it a momentous decision for Australia to acquire the technology. He said it would make the world safer. Senior Biden administration officials, who briefed reporters ahead of the announcement, said the move was not aimed at countering Beijing. However, Washington and its allies have been looking for new ways to push back against Beijing's growing power and influence. China's Washington embassy reacted to the new partnership, saying that countries should not build exclusionary blocks and accused them of having a Cold War mentality. The Chinese ambassador to Britain has been prevented from attending a recent parliamentary gathering by the government due to China's recent sanctions imposed on lawmakers battling the human rights violations in Xinjiang. China has hit out at the UK for barring its ambassador from attending an event in the British Parliament, describing the move as despicable and cowardly. Chen Zegan had been due to speak at an event in Parliament on Wednesday, but was told by the parliamentary speaker that he could not attend while Beijing's own sanctions remain in place against a number of MPs and peers. China placed the sanctions on five British lawmakers, including the former Conservative Party leader Ian Duncan Smith, in March after they highlighted alleged human rights abuses in China's Xinjiang province. Beijing accused them of spreading what it said were lies and disinformation over the treatment of Uyghur Muslims. China took the action after Britain, the United States, the European Union and Canada imposed parallel sanctions on senior Chinese officials. Those targeted were accused of the mass internment of Uyghur Muslims in Xinjiang. This latest flare-up between Beijing and London comes at a time when the two sides have already been trading barbs over a range of issues, including China's reforms in the former British colony Hong Kong and China's trade policy. The fight against health threats and climate change will be the EU's top priorities in the coming year, Commission President Ursula von der Leyen announced in her annual State of the Union address. It's an annual policy speech given before the European Parliament. In her second State of the European Union address, Commission President Ursula von der Leyen laid out the bloc's accomplishments, goals and priorities. The wide-ranging speech touched on everything from climate change to human rights and migration. 
but fighting the spread of COVID-19 was front and center. Our first and most urgent priority is to speed up global vaccination. We have already committed to share 250 million doses of vaccine. I can announce today that the Commission will add a new donation of another 200 million doses until the middle of next year. Significant funds will also go toward post-collapse Afghanistan. Von der Leyen pledged an additional 100 million euros, saying the 27-nation bloc stands by the Afghan people. We must do everything to avert the real risk that is out there of a major famine and a humanitarian disaster. Finally, European defense ranked high on the list of priorities. Von der Leyen said Europe will seek to boost its own military capacity and create new defenses in cyberspace. As part of this effort, a special defense summit will be convened with France next year. With less than two weeks before Germans elect a new parliament, a FOSA poll showed that three opposition parties polling at 11 and 6 percent respectively, below, well below the 25 percent of centre-left Social Democrats of Olaf Scholz and Chancellor Angela Merkel's Conservatives at 21 percent. Let's cross over to other than the World News Pressure correspondent Inuka Ponzo reporting from Cleve in Germany for more. Inuka? Yes, Shanali. Germans are preparing to elect a new parliament on September the 26th. The business friendly Free Democrats with their leader Christian Linder hope to join forces with the CDU in a new government. Linder said the election goal is a two-digit figure as high as possible so that there won't be a majority of CDU and Greens, adding he wished for a government which must be shaped of the political middle together with strong Free Democrats. The far-right alternative for Germany, who all parties represented in the Bundestag, have excluded going into a coalition with, also stood at 11%. The smallest opposition party in the German parliament is the far-left Die Linke, who are currently polling at 6%. While the SPD has not excluded a possible coalition government with the support of Die Linke, the conservative candidate Armin Laschet has repeatedly warned against such an alliance. Back to Shanali. All right, thank you. That was other than a World News Special Correspondent Inu Kaponso reporting from Cleve in Germany. North Korea's launching of two short-range ballistic missiles into the sea has sparked an international outcry, prompting the UN to scramble for a diplomatic response. Several countries condemned the test firings, calling the North's move a threat to international security. The United Nations Security Council has decided to hold an emergency meeting Wednesday on the situation on the Korean Peninsula, where both South and North Korea have recently carried out ballistic missile tests. A diplomatic source told AFP that the meeting was requested by France and Estonia and will be held informally behind closed doors. This comes after the UN expressed deep concern over the latest missile launches by North Korea. We're very much aware of the media reports and are concerned by the latest developments that we've seen. Uh, as we've said before, diplomatic engagement remains the only pathway to sustainable peace and complete verifiable denuclearization of the Korean Peninsula. According to South Korea's Joint Chiefs of Staff, the isolated regime fired two short-range ballistic missiles into the East Sea on Wednesday, local time, after testing a new cruise missile over the weekend. The United States has condemned the launch, calling the act a violation of Security Council resolutions that poses a threat to its neighbors and the international community. A State Department official said, however, the country remains committed to dialogue with the North. We have no hostile intent towards the DPRK. We've been very clear uh, about that. Uh, what we seek to do is to reduce the threat uh, to the United States, uh, to our allies uh, in the region, and that includes the ROK and Japan. Uh, and we think we can do that uh, through diplomacy. Japanese Prime Minister Yoshihide Suga, meanwhile, has denounced the launch as, quote, simply outrageous and a threat to the peace and security of the region. The latest on the COVID crisis right after this break, you're watching World News.
Welcome back. The Pope has come forward to support the world's vaccination drive accelerate further by urging the reluctant masses to get jabbed, stating that the vaccines are in fact humanity's friends. Pope Francis said on Wednesday he was puzzled why so many people, including some cardinals in the Roman Catholic Church hierarchy, have refused to get inoculated against COVID-19. The Pope was responding to a question from a reporter about vaccine hesitancy aboard a plane returning from Slovakia. It's a bit strange because humanity has a history of friendship with vaccines. When we were children, we had the vaccine for measles and others, polio, and nobody protested. Then came all this. Francis, who has been vaccinated against COVID, has often urged others to get inoculated for the common good. On the plane, he said perhaps some people were afraid at first because there were various vaccines available and some turned out to be, quote, little more than distilled water. He did not name any vaccines. He went on to say that even some within the high ranks of the Catholic Church are experiencing vaccine hesitancy. Even in the College of Cardinals, there are some deniers and one of those poor people is hospitalized with the virus. There is a need for clarity and to talk calmly with these people. In the Vatican, we are all vaccinated except for a small group and we are studying how to help them. Cardinal Raymond Brooke, a conservative and vaccine skeptic, was hospitalized in the United States last month after contracting the virus. Some conservative anti-vaccine bishops, particularly in the United States, have said Catholics should have the possibility of claiming conscientious objection to the vaccine on religious grounds. But the Pope has made clear in the past that he disagrees, never having mentioned the option. The French government faces a standoff with tens of thousands of health workers and care carers over a new rule requiring them to receive a COVID-19 vaccine or face suspension without pay. For further details on this, we now cross over to other than our world news pressure correspondent Chetana Dharmaratna reporting from Normandy in France. Chetana. Yes, Janali. Hospital staff, ambulance drivers, retirement home workers, private doctors, fire service members and people caring for the elderly or infirm in their homes, some 2.7 million people in total must be able to prove they have had at least one shot of the vaccine. President Emmanuel Macron issued the ultimum two months ago, but tens of thousands of carriers remained unvaccinated. One of the France's biggest public sector unions has warned for a health catastrophe if the government suspends a large number of health workers and bars private sector doctors from practicing. Defiant health workers have joined opponents of a new coronavirus health pass required for entry to restaurants, cafes and museums at weekly protests held across the France in the past two months. The National Federation of Ambulance Workers in the late August estimated that 13% of its members were still resisting coronavirus shots. Despite appeals by French unions for leniency, the government has vowed to see the policy through. Back to you, Shanali. All right, thank you. That was Adi Derana World News Special Correspondent Chetan Dharmaratna reporting from Normandy in France. Guinea's military rule has begun talks of transition and has started conserving with major leaders in different fields of the country in order to dominate over the previous reigning government. Guinea's new military rulers have started consultations with political business and religious leaders. The purpose, they say, is the formation of a transitional government following the coup that ousted President Alpha Conde earlier this month. In a short address, coup leader Mamadi Doumbouya urged attendees to not repeat the errors of the past when forming a new system of government. Colonel Doumbouya is a special forces commander and former member of the French Foreign Legion. He and the other soldiers behind the coup say they toppled Conde because of concerns about poverty and corruption. The talks are expected to set out the duration of the transition and who will lead it, as well as what political and institutional reforms are needed before elections. The discussions began on Tuesday with a meeting of the heads of the main political parties. Makale Kamara, leader of the Front for National Alliance, said Dumbuya emphasized the need for reconciliation. But the junta's seizure of power has also been widely condemned by Guinea's allies and regional organizations. 
West Africa's main political and economic bloc, ECOWAS, has suspended Guinea from its decision-making bodies and called for a short, civilian-led transition. We have some good news for you. The amount of plastic is brutal, a design engineer from Spain's island of Gran Canaria said as he painstakingly collects pieces of plastic waste from the shore at Playa Barranca Beach. Humberto develops a project to clean up the coastline by turning plastic waste into furniture. Plastic can remain intact on land or in water for centuries, but Humberto's project seeks to capitalize on that trait that is so negative to the environment, transforming it into a positive aspect of his designs. Around the world, one million plastic drinking bottles are purchased every minute, while five trillion single-use plastic bags are used worldwide every year. Humberto finds all kinds of plastic waste from hard hats to bottle caps in his collection expeditions and picks up at an average of five kilos at a time on the Atlantic shores of Gran Canaria. He then sorts the plastic weights by color to create bright products ranging from the modern space age, stools to rings used as cloth hangers. Not all plastic Humberto collects is suitable to recycle as furniture, but when he's picking are slim, at the very least he says, we have cleaned the beach. Welcome back and for more news, let's take you around the world in a minute. Spanish Coast Guards transported 120 migrants rescued in the Atlantic Ocean to a port on the island of Gran Canaria and two boats with 60 migrants on board arrived by their own means in Lanzarota. Graphic video shows residents of the Faroe Islands slashing dolphins and turning the water red with blood during a century-old tradition, grinded rap hunt and fooling protests from environmental activists. A traditional marzipan manufacturer in Germany is hoping to sweeten Merkel's departure by offering a suite of the Chancellor's face. This marzipan maker is offering a sweet souvenir for German as Chancellor Angela Merkel prepares to step down after 16 years. New Zealand Prime Minister Jacinda Ardern said that Australia's new nuclear-powered submarines would not be allowed in its territorial waters under a long-standing nuclear-free policy. Mexican President Andreas Manuel Lopez Obrador performed his independence cry from the balcony of the presidential palace in the center of Mexico City. Members of the Taliban returned to their Afghan stronghold, Kandahar, a month after the group swept to power. Video of the convoy showed many vehicles that were captured from the toppled Republican Afghan government, the United States of the Allies. On the latest crackdown on big tech, Russia has fined media giants Facebook and Twitter for failing to take down content that was banned within the country. A Russian court on Tuesday said it had fined US social media giants Facebook and Twitter for failing to delete content that Moscow deems illegal. The move forms part of a wider crackdown on the sector. Moscow wants foreign big tech firms to open full-fledged offices in Russia and to store Russians' personal data on its territory. The government also published plans on Tuesday to impose new taxes on foreign-owned digital services as part of a push to support its domestic tech sector. The court said Facebook had been handed five fines, totaling 21 million rubles, or almost $288,000. Twitter received two fines, while popular messaging app Telegram was also penalised. Facebook, Twitter and Telegram did not immediately respond to requests for comment. Twitter has been subject of a punitive slowdown since March. Russia says Twitter and other social media firms have not deleted posts featuring banned material quickly enough. And finally tonight, Broadway's biggest musicals roared back to life after an unprecedented 18-month pandemic-induced shutdown that cast an eerie silence over the New York's usual bustling theatre district. The curtain rose again on top musicals Hamilton, The Lion King and Wicked before packed audiences in the biggest sign that Broadway is open again for business. The day has finally come. In front of a raucous audience, Broadway juggernaut Wicked sprang back to life. It's going to see me! Other top musicals, The Lion King, Hamilton and Chicago, 
also had the curtain go up after a staggering 18-month closure. Hamilton's creator was holding back his tears as he thanked health workers and supporters. I don't ever want to take live theatre for granted ever again, do you? Some shows, like Bruce Springsteen and Hadestown, have been performing at limited capacity since the summer. But Tuesday was the first day Broadway theatres could pack their halls full, marking the final step in New York's reopening. The full reopening comes after months spent on upgrading air filter systems and figuring out how to keep the virus at bay, both for actors, audiences and backstage staff. And that's all the news we have for you tonight. Join us again tomorrow with another edition of World News. I'm Suzanne Shanali. Until then, stay safe and have a good night.